some people talk about the Christ win now as, uh, I suppose, the climax of a 40-year recessionary wave, going back to you know, the early 70s. Um, you could maybe add, because I think it possibly even complements that idea in terms of understanding what's going on, is a bit the, the basic categories of capitalism. It probably helps to understand it if you add George Soros's view, which is not a Marxist view, that we are at the end of a 60-year credit expansion. It's useful because we can come back and look at the significance of credit or fictitious capital for capitalism, especially in that last 60 years or 40 years in particular. Um, but it does, in a way, Soros is right, and I'll come back to it, it does go back 60 years, the, um, credit, the, the era of credit expansion. Um, it reaffirms, this crisis reaffirms the logic and contradictions of the capitalist economy. So basically, that profit is, in essence at least, about the extraction of surplus value. But also, that for that value to become profit, it has to be valorized. It's an invalid. Because people who are very poor are not a good market for the valorization of capital. Now, this was always a problem with the idea that the Eastern European economies would save capitalism and would be you know, the salvation, I suppose, of the already looming problems of neoliberalism in the late 80s, early 90s. So if you look, for example, at even, say, Australia, this might come in the Australian discussion, but just to take our own country here, um, Something like 8 million Australians, which is a very sizable portion of the population, live on an income of less than $21,000 per annum. That's not very much money. 4.5 million of those, so again, a good sizable proportion of the entire entirety of the country, it's actually 23%, of, live in households where the aggregate household income is less than $400 a week. So actually, social inequality, which is of course only growing, including in, and is in fact a premise for, the growth of the so-called uh, new powers, that what I refer to uh, now by everybody as the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, was <laughs> the big one. Um, the premise, or one of the fundamental premises of the growth there is precisely the growing social inequality. India is incredible, actually more incredible than China, for obvious reasons in terms of the, the character of the economy, the growth of inequality. And this is a big problem in terms of the valorization, actually a fundamental problem in terms of the valorization of capital. Um, now, essentially, the way that late capitalism has dealt with this is by the state stepping in. So actually, when the state, or more particularly government, step in now in the context of this new crisis, there's nothing new about that. There's nothing even specifically Keynesian about that. They're stepping in like states have been stepping in for some time to assist in this or somehow facilitate, as far as is possible, the valorization of capital profits. Fundamentally, it does it, the state has done it, I should say, like capitalism, through the armament industry, through the environment, actually, that goes back a long way. I've come back to this because this is an interesting discussion in terms of the so-called potential saving, from the capitalist point of view, the saving potential of green capitalism. And, of course, infrastructure. Um, now, I mean, this is probably why, incidentally, we'll talk about this in this conversation, why, in some respects, the stimulus package here was a bit more intelligent than the stimulus package anywhere else in the world, actually, if you look at what they did, because there was actual spending on infrastructure substantial stimulus infrastructure. So, actually, a figure that Mandel has, I don't have more recent figures, but it demonstrates this, is if you look at US um, state expenditure in proportion to GDP, this is in the US, compared to the beginning of the last century, in 1913, that state expenditure in proportion to GDP was 7.1%. By 1970, it was 33.2%. Big lead. And I'm sure, you know, I haven't seen figures of that type of measurement anyway, but I'm sure it would be higher, not less today than that 33.2%. That's the proportion of GDP state spends, of state spending, I should say. What is happening now 
is an exhaustion of the neoliberal model of accumulation. That way of making money, if you like. And all the figures demonstrate that, in particular in terms of the sh decreasing share of wages in, in GDP, um, which of course means a decrease in surplus value. So if you look at the decreasing share of wages in GDP, um, in between 1980 and, and 2006, the share of wages, um, for, this is for the 15 OECD countries, went from 67 to 57% as well. So quite a significant percentage change. Um, actually, in the advanced economies as a whole, it went down 9%. Um, in Latin America, it was the highest. This actually does have some relation to the political situation there, which I'll come back to. And of course, what happened, a characteristic of this neoliberalism was that money was not invested. The money that was being made was not being invested by and large in productive investments. It was being invested in finance itself, credit. Um, that was quite a fundamental feature of, or at least the effect of, of neoliberalism. So what's capitalism trying to do about this? Um, well, Various economists, some of the fourth international people, have outlined um, the various options, and we've probably seen these in practice between the, the major players, the US, Australia, Japan, even China, the different way the European powers. In theory, there is the free market possibility, the free market approach, but no one's trying to sell that, um, because that would just be a way of saying, you know, let dog eat dog. Now, that actually might, funnily enough, have the best economic result in the short term, but of course economics and politics go together. <laughs> um, and it is a politically unallowable option. Um, as is the other possibility, which is sort of a corollary of that, of the free market approach, and that is an inflation approach. Just let inflation take its course. Prices rise, you know, we'll even things out, check out all the weak competitors, etc. Again, not a very favoured approach. More favoured has been the approach of bailouts. But the problem with bailouts, and the American example is the best, is that it does nothing to assist in this key problem of valorisation. Nothing at all. In fact, it arguably accentuates that um, because it reduces basically, um, basically because of the impact it has on wages. It effectively reduces the surplus value, you know, because if you're given like we were in Australia an extra, two, you know, two thousand dollars a head, that's a bit more to to you as what well, more to your income. So, more probably more successful, and the Australian example is the best, have been these uh, stimulus packages and that approach, that approach to it. But as Mandel points out, mere stimulation of consumer demand is doubly ineffective under capitalist conditions. Firstly, it lowers the rate of surplus value, as with bailouts, and hence also the rate of profit. And secondly, it does not decrease, sorry, it does not increase entrepreneurial investment activity, or at least not per se. With the pop, with the link, talks about possible exceptions in, the, in department two, that is you know, effectively in consumer goods, etc. That's that, what Mandel is saying is that for something like this, a stimulus package to be successful, it has to promote an ups or for it to be successful and promote an upswing in investment in the economy, it has to create additional markets. Um, so in other words, most likely armaments or public spending on infrastructure. And that's probably where there is, you know, maybe maybe people in the Australian um, regime were a little bit more <laughs> sensitive to this in terms of their spending of the stimulus package, witness in particular that capital expenditure in the education sector, which is massive. Um, other capitalist economies. Um, now, the other possibility is the least likely of all, but some bourgeois economists are talking about it, and that is the idea of rebalancing the world economy, because part of this crisis is about the imbalances in the world, i.e. the fact that the Germans have all this stuff to sell, and the Chinese have all this stuff to sell, but the only market to buy it has been the US. But of course, re any rebalancing of the world economy requires some element of planning way beyond what's possible in terms of capitalist cooperation. In fact, the opposite is happening. Countries are basically making decisions on the basis of their own interests. This is particularly the case in Europe, where the French, the Germans, are making decisions on the basis often of their very narrow interests 
even with an impulse towards protectionism.